I think we owe this praise and worship team a round of applause, don't we? <laughs> to Dr. Dallas, the faculty, staff, and student body here at Shorter University, it is good to be amongst your presence. I was blessed to be the commencement speaker at this past year's graduation, and I'm very grateful for having that opportunity and just a joy to be here on the campus here for your chapel today. I greet you on behalf of the Elizabeth Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, and our Pastor Craig L. Oliver Sr., and I'm honored to greet you in representing my family, the Cochran family, on this morning. Uh, if you would stand with me, I want, to do, uh, I want you to participate with me in three things before I share the message this morning. The first one is a, a very patriotic something. And then I want to share a foundational scripture and give you a theme to think on as I share the words that God has given me to share with you today. Would you repeat the, these words after me? We the people. Come on, let's, let's do it. This is a student body that's strong and do it as you are, as though you were at one of the sports games we the people, we the people of, the States, of the United States in order to form, order to form a, more a more perfect union establish justice, establish justice ensure, domestic ensure domestic tranquility provide for the common defense, for the common defense promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty, and the of liberty to ourselves and our, our posterity. Do ordain, Do ordain and, establish and establish this constitution, this constitution for, the for the United States of America. There's a scripture I want you to think about as I share my remarks. It comes from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 14, reads something along these lines. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Dear God, our Heavenly Father, how we praise you and thank you for the blessed privilege of being in the United States of America. Most of us as natural born citizens and this, our dear country, the land of the free and the home of the brave, a nation where we can worship you like we just did without fear of consequences, where we can live out our faith as we do every day without fear of consequences. Now, Father, I pray your blessings upon me as I share the message you have given me to share with the faculty, staff, and students here, this wonderful university. And as I stand before these, my brothers and sisters, Father, I pray that they would see you in me and that they would hear you when I speak. And I'll be careful to give you all the praise in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, there's a theme that I want you to think about as I share these words with you for about 30 minutes. It's called the blessings of sufferings. The blessings of sufferings. And there's a subheading, real life application in real time. The blessings of suffering, real life application in real time. There's an ever increasing attack, assault, and threat on freedom of religion and freedom of speech in our beloved United States of America. My story is one of many where a government entity and special interest groups have imposed adverse consequences on an American for publicly proclaiming a position based upon biblical truths. There is a significant need, faculty, staff, and student body, for the body of Christ to rise to unprecedented levels of unity and solidarity regarding religious liberty, 
Our divisions by religions and secular standards have diluted the power and influence of our collective voice as believers, and believers are under constant attack today in our precious nation for expressing and even living out their faith. Being a firefighter, I have lived a life of public service. My life of public service became highly publicized last Thanksgiving 2014 as a result of a highly publicized 30-day suspension without pay and subsequent termination from employment after 34 years of faithful service in the fire and emergency services industry while serving as the fire chief of the city of Atlanta, where I served faithfully for seven years. Under the leadership of the Honorable Mayor Kasim Reed, whom I still respect and honor in the Lord our God even today. This adverse action against me came as a result of a book that I wrote on my own time for Christian men called Who Told You That You Were Naked? Overcoming the Stronghold of Condemnation. As I reflected over my life during the weeks that followed my termination, I began to realize that God had been preparing me for this my entire life. And I came to the realization that as Christians, our walk of faith is comprised of a series of level plains, mountain climbs, and valleys. And that sufferings are an inherent and necessary component for fulfilling God's purpose in our lives. When I was serving as fire chief in Shreveport, Louisiana in the early 2000s, I began to experience a series of personal and professional challenges, and I began to seek God for answers to what was going on. And God led me to a word study on that word sufferings that we heard in 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14, and that's in the theme that I shared with you earlier. When I looked at the word suffering in the Old Testament and New Testament, I found out that when we see words like afflictions, trials, tribulation, tests, troubles, persecution, and chastisement, they all fall under the heading of sufferings. And then I began to look at men and women in the scripture that had experienced sufferings. And I realized that there are essentially two categories of sufferings. There are self-inflicted sufferings and there are God-allowed Sufferings. Now, the self-inflicted suffering is pretty self-explanatory. They are the trials, tribulations, tests, persecutions, afflictions, and chastisement that we bring upon ourselves. In our walk of faith, sometimes we engage in behaviors and activity that we know go against the principles, precepts, and standards that God has established for us to live by and there are consequences associated with being disobedient to God that fall, that causes us to fall in the self-inflicted category. Most of the sufferings that I have experienced in my life fall in the self-inflicted suffering category. Things that I brought on myself. And listen, the other category, the God allowed sufferings or sufferings that has nothing to do with what we have done, but has everything to do with what God is doing in and through our lives. So let me just put it a little plainer. There was a period in my life that I call the wilderness period that started when I began to go to college. And in the wilderness period, I began to develop ways and habits and relationships that were against the precepts and principles that, that I was taught as a Christian growing up all of my life. When I was in the wilderness period, I began to experience multiple self-inflicted sufferings that brought trials and tribulations and tests and chastisement because God was using those experiences to bring me back in alignment with his purpose and will for my life. Chances are there are some college students here at Shorter University that can relate to my testimony about the wilderness period and about self-inflicted sufferings and the consequences associated with experiencing being disobedient. God 
is not going to give up on us. And he uses sufferings to prune bad habits, bad relationships and bad ways so he can develop his personality and his character in our lives. Now, the God allowed suffering category, the reason why it's important to know the difference between the two is because when you're going through persecution like I'm experiencing for living out my faith, it's important for a believer to know that you're not being punished for something that you didn't do or that you did that went against the will and purpose and precepts of God. This is God at work in your life, and he's going to do it for his glory. Now, when I began to look at those two categories, God showed me that I was in some pretty decent company when it comes to God-allowed sufferings. If you went to vacation Bible school or had a good Sunday school teacher or preacher going up, you heard the story of Job. Job is a good example of God-allowed suffering, where God volunteered him for unimaginable sufferings. Esther, if you heard the story of Esther, she's a good example. Joseph, if you heard about Joseph, he's a good example of a lifelong litany of God-allowed sufferings. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego are good examples of God-allowed suffering. Daniel is a good example of God-allowed suffering. Jesus Christ is a good example of God-allowed suffering. Let me just tell you a little bit about Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, because that kind of their story and Daniel's story kind of have some lessons in it for me to learn. And I think for all of us to learn, they were faithful government employees, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in Babylon. And they were obedient to the laws of the land, except for the king, Nebuchadnezzar, decided that he was going to create this God and everybody when the music started playing, all the government officials and citizens had to bow down to this God. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, pretty much took a position that we've been obedient and honored, you King Nebuchadnezzar, but this thing we cannot do. And Nebuchadnezzar said, do you realize you're facing the death penalty, a fiery furnace, if you don't bow down to this God? And they said, oh, yes, King, we realize that we're facing the death penalty, a fiery furnace, but our God is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, and even if he chooses not to, we will still not bow down. He became so angry, he told the guards to heat it up seven times hotter than it was supposed to be. The guards that was taking them in to throw them in burned alive and threw them in. And he watched with great excitement to see them burn alive, and then he saw something very, very strange in his own testimony. He said, I thought we threw three people in there. I see four. And the fourth one looks like the son of God. He was amazed. So he said, they won't burn. I may as well bring them out. He brought them out and they were not even singed. The scripture says they didn't even smell like smoke. Being a firefighter, I can tell you they were supposed to burn and they were supposed to smell like smoke. But because of that fourth person that showed up, they came out unscathed. Daniel, their friend, a few kings later, another faithful government employee, had the favor of this king, Darius, had a consistent walk of faith, so much so that his friends and co-workers knew about his lifestyle of faith. The king was thinking about putting Daniel over the whole kingdom. He was already one of three presidents in Babylon, but the king was thinking about putting him over everything. They found out his co-workers, his colleagues, who were the other government officials, and they said, we got to do something with this Daniel. The only way we're going to get to him is through his relationship with his God. What a testimony for people to have to say about us. If we're going to bring him down, it's going to be through his relationship with his God. So they crafted a piece of legislation. They had legislative powers. Trick King Darius into signing it. And the decree was, no one can pray to you, Darius, for 30 days. Now, when I read that 30-day part in the scripture, that got my attention because I was suspended without pay for 30 days. So I watched the text a lot closer then. Daniel, when he found out that no one in the kingdom could pray for 30 days, guess what he did? He continued his prayer life of praying three times a day. He realized that he was facing the death penalty, the lion's den. 
as a result of that. You know, I, I, under this government of Babylon, it changed from the fiery furnace to the lion's den two kings later. You know what I believe happened? I believe the chief of those security guards who threw Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego in the fiery furnace uh, said to the kings and made a decree that, hey, we can't use this fiery furnace anymore. Bubba, Boudro, and Joey, they got burned alive trying to throw them in the fiery furnace. So we got to come up with something else so I can save my troops. And so they changed it to a lion's den. Well, the king found out that they caught Daniel praying. He couldn't change it based on the law. So he had to throw Daniel into the lion's den. He loved Daniel so much he didn't even sleep that night. The next morning, he ran over to the lion's den asking a question. Is the God of Daniel able to deliver him from the lions? And he found out his answer when he arrived. Daniel was still alive. And he brought him out of the lion's den alive. And the co-workers and colleagues that plotted against him so that he wouldn't be in charge of everything, they and their families were thrown in the lion's den and became food for the lions. And since all of them were dead, Daniel was over everything anyway. Because what God has for you cannot be stopped by anybody. So here are some things I want you to take note of before I share with you. How did God prepare me for what I'm going through? There are five things. Listen, my brothers and sisters in Christ, students, faculty, staff at Shorter University, if you have not experienced persecution on some scale for living out and expressing your faith, be prepared because your day is coming. It may not be on a grand scale like mine, and it could be on a greater scale than mine. But listen, believers are being tested every single day, and there are some things that I want to share with you that you need to know. The first thing is, if you face any form of suffering, God allows suffering, realize that God has prepared you for it. God always prepares his sons and daughters for sufferings. He always does. The second lesson is the toughest lesson. There are worldly consequences for standing for Christ and for standing on biblical truths today. There are worldly consequences. Over in Egypt, about this time last year, ISIS terrorists kidnapped over 20 Christian Egyptian men and told them that they were going to kill them by beheading lest they renounce their faith in Jesus Christ. They faced the death penalty like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. They chose the death penalty rather than rejecting their faith in Christ, and their heads were cut off. A couple of months later, in villages in Afghanistan, a radical Muslim group was going through villages where Christian families were known to live. When they found a Christian family, they would bring them up to the front of the house, and the wife, husband, and children, they would tell the mother and father, we're going to kill your children lest you renounce your faith in Jesus Christ. Many of those families, at the death rift, death threat of their precious children did not renounce their faith in Jesus Christ and their children were killed. Their precious children were killed right in front of them because there are worldly consequences for standing on biblical truth and standing for Christ. When this, was, this one's going to hit a little closer to home to you. A few months after that in North Africa at a college in North Africa where Muslim and Christian students were known to attend, another radical Muslim group went to the campus, separated the Muslim students from the Christian students, told the Christian students, we're going to kill you. But you have a chance to live if you renounce your faith in Jesus Christ. You can get over on the safe side. Over 125 college kids in Africa chose not to renounce their faith in Jesus Christ, and they were gunned down on the spot. There are worldly consequences for standing on biblical truth and for standing for Christ. Let me tell you that in the United States of America, we are not close to coming to those kinds of consequences. Lest as a church, we stay silent, divided, and passive. If we remain silent, passive, and divided, 
uh, then the possibilities do exist that that could happen here in our nation. But let me share with you some examples of worldly consequences that Christians in America are giving into and bowing down to. We have Americans who will reject their faith in Christ and the biblical principles that they have espoused for years because they don't want to lose an election. We have Christians who will not stand for biblical principles and stand for Christ because they don't want to lose a business or a government contract. We have pastors even in the United States who won't speak truth from the pulpit because they don't want to lose church members or there's a governing authority over the church that if they speak truth, they could even lose the church. And so they reject biblical truth and reject Christ speaking the truth because of that. We have young adults who find out that the person they are relate, re, engaged with or dating does not believe the Bible as they believe, but because they have been in a relationship for so long, even maybe at a point of being engaged, they forsake biblical truths because they've just got too much invested in this relationship and it's got too much invested in the marriage and it's too late to turn back now. So I'll just relinquish my faith in Christ and biblical truth just to get along. I'll just take a passive position because they don't want to lose a relationship with a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Some college kids re reject biblical truth and biblical principles because there's just certain social circles that you cannot participate in that are popular on campus lest you bow down to the popular culture and values of the nation today. There are worldly consequences for standing for biblical truth and for standing for Christ. I lost my job, but I still have my head. I still have my wife and my children. And God has given me another job that I have more joy even in my childhood dream come true fairy tale fire service career at my own church being the chief operating officer of my church. The third lesson is there are kingdom consequences for standing for biblical truths and the kingdom consequences, listen, are always greater than the worldly consequences. The kingdom consequences are always greater than the worldly consequences. But what we have, my young brothers and sisters in the student body, faculty and staff, we have more believers who have greater fear in the worldly consequences than faith in the kingdom consequences. And because believers continue to fold under fear of worldly consequences, there are not enough of us in the United States who are living proof of the kingdom consequences so that all of us can be emboldened and encouraged to stand when our day of persecution comes. Jesus made a promise. Peter got offended when Jesus was explaining how difficult it was for a wealthy person to enter into the kingdom of heaven because not because rich people can't go to heaven because many of them put their money over their the Lord and Savior, their faith. And Peter didn't get it fully understood. So he said, I think with a little bit of an attitude, wait a minute, because Peter was one of the sons of the Zebedee Fishing Company was a big, big business back in those days. And so he said, wait a minute, we've left everything to follow you. What are you talking about? Jesus said, let me set the record straight. You have not left business or houses or lands or husbands or wife or, or anything for my sake that you shall not receive in return 100 fold in this life with persecution and after that eternal life. So what did Jesus mean by 100 fold? If you lose a girlfriend for standing on biblical truth, Jesus said you'll get a hundredfold girlfriend in return. If you lose a boyfriend for standing for Christ, Jesus says you'll get a hundredfold boyfriend in return. What is that? What's the difference between what's the difference between a hundred percent and a hundredfold? Hundred percent means you'll get one just like the one you lost. Hundredfold means you'll get one a hundred times better than the one you lost. And so we've got some college students and young adults hanging on to someone who's forsaken their biblical truths and values, and they're depriving themselves of someone a hundredfold 
better. Jesus wasn't exaggerating when he said 100 fold. Whatever you lose, you'll get it back 100 fold. And so the fourth lesson is sufferings are always for the glory of God. Nebuchadnezzar is a good example. After he brought Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out, he said, no one can worship any other God but the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God was glorified because they stood. God was glorified. Darius said the same thing when he brought Daniel out of the lion's den. No one can worship any other God but the God of Daniel. God was glorified. When we stand, God is glorified. And for the last lesson of the five, for the child of God who endures suffering and chooses to stand on biblical truth and stand for Christ, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has entered into the heart of a man the things that God has prepared for them who stand. There's a scripture that says, God looks over the earth, searching for a heart that is fully his, so that he may strongly show his support on their behalf. Let me tell you something. I am so grateful that God has saw fit in me to choose me to show the world what the hundredfold life looks like for the person who strongly, who stands on his behalf. Keep watching what God is doing because there are believers all over this country who are going to be testimonies of what Jesus meant by the hundredfold life for those who endure persecution. So how did God prepare me for what I'm going through? He prepared me through my childhood upbringing. He prepared me in my career and he prepared me through my family. I was born in a very poor family in Shreveport, Louisiana. At the time I was born, I had three big brothers. I was born at a hospital called Confederate Memorial Hospital. It was where the poor families went to have their health care needs met. And when my mom took me home from the hospital, we were living in a government project in Allendale, the poorest neighborhood in Shreveport. Three years later, two little girls were added to our family, and dad decided to leave us, and he left my mother, he was an alcoholic, to go and live with another woman. We were very poor when dad was with us, but we went to a whole nother category when dad left us. We went from poor to po, just P-O, <laughs> because we didn't have enough income to qualify for P-O-O-R anymore. So we became po, and we, had, we were evicted from the projects. And my mother moved us a few blocks over to a little alley where there's a shot, shotgun houses on both sides of the alley. And it had, of course, a shotgun house. It's a house with three rooms, a front room, a middle room, and a back room. And if you open the front door and the back door, you can see straight through. And the reason why they call them shotgun houses, if you shot a gun in the front door, it'll go straight out the back door without touching anything. So my, me and my, four, my, my three brothers, we slept in the same bed. It was a box spring and a mattress stacked up on cinder blocks with boards across the top to hold up the back, box spring and the mattress. In the same little room, my, brother, my little sisters slept in a bed all by themselves, a little twin-sized bed, box spring and mattress stacked on bricks with boards across the top. We were on the welfare program and food stamps at school. We were on the free lunch program at school. And poverty was an awful thing. I remember at the beginning of the month, we, we got a lot of groceries. But at the end of the month, with six kids at home, we were out most of the time. And my mama only could afford enough groceries to buy bread, syrup, and mayonnaise. And so we would have toast with burr rabbit syrup for breakfast. We would have mayonnaise sandwiches for lunch, mayonnaise sandwiches for dinner. All the pop and Kool-Aid was gone. So if we wanted something sweet to drink, we'd get a couple of teaspoons of sugar, put it in a cold glass of water, and we would have sugar water with our mayonnaise sandwiches. There were times when my mother would tell us, keep all the pots and jugs in the house full of water. And we would wonder why, because we turned on the faucet, water would come out. A few days later, there was no water. She realized she had received the cutoff notice, and it was just a matter of days. And so when the water was turned off, we used the pots and jugs of water to bathe with, to cook with, and to flush the to toilets with. My two little sisters would bathe first in some water, 
And then I would take a bath in the same water that they bathed in. My three big brothers, we, we let the water out. My three big brothers would take a bath in the same water. And then my mother would take a bath in a fresh set of water. But we were very poor. And I realized poverty was a terrible thing. But it was also in that alley at five years old that we were laying on the front room floor of our shotgun house watching a little black and white TV with a coat hanger sticking out of the top of it wrapped in some aluminum foil uh, because we had broken the rabbit ears off of the TV rough housing in the house the boys were uh, and uh, I better explain that rabbit ear kind of thing uh, to this this group on the floor right here uh, we didn't have cable back in those days there was a thing you put on top of the TV it had some yeah no I'm Explain them to them a, a, a little later what rabbit ears are. We didn't cut off a rabbit's head and stick their ears on TV. Anyway, we heard the noise of sirens responding through the neighborhood, which happened all the time. But this particular Sunday, as loud as we ever heard before, we sprang to our feet, opened the front door. Right in front of our house was a big red fire truck. And as we watched those firefighters that day, my eyes grew that large. And I looked at my mama and brothers and sisters and said, I want to be a fireman when I grow up. But it was also in that alley that I realized it was awful not having a daddy at home. In my neighborhood, only about three families had mom, dad, and children in the home. The rest of them were raised by single parents. But at the top of the alley was the Galilee Baptist Church. And I used to go to that church on Sunday, had to in my house. And I used to watch the men who had cars, a few of them did, drive up with their families in nice cars. They would get out and they'd have on a nice suit. And I'd look at those men and I'd say, I sure wish I had a dad with a car like that and that had, could dress like that. And then their wives would get out of the car so much nicer dressed than my mom, hair nice and pretty around my mom's age. And I would say, man, I sure wish my mother had clothes like that and could fix her hair like that. And then their kids would get out of the car around me and my little sister's age. And they were so nicely dressed, so much nicer than me and my brothers and sisters. And I would say, man, sure wish we had clothes like that. The men at Galilee Baptist Church gave me a vision of what family was to be like. And so the grown-ups used to ask us all the time, what do you want to be when you grow up? I tell them I want to be a firefighter. I don't want to be poor. And I want a family. And this is what they told me. All your dreams are going to come true if you believe in and have faith in God. If you go to school and get a good education, if you respect grown-ups and treat other children like you want to be treated, all of your dreams are going to come true. And let me tell you something. That still works today in our country, and it worked for me amazingly well. In 1981, I became a Shreveport firefighter, and because I continued to apply those principles in my career, I promoted very quickly in my career. I call it a fairy tale career. In four years, I became a captain. In 10 years, I was an assistant chief. It usually takes 25 years to get there. With 18 years on the department in Shreveport, I was the fire chief of the Shreveport Fire Department. Eight years later, I get a call from Atlanta. Mayor Shirley Franklin wants me to come over and serve as the fire chief of the city of Atlanta. I served her faithfully for 20 months. President Obama was elected and called and wanted me to serve as the United States Fire Administrator in the Department of Homeland Security, the highest fire official in the United States of America that came from a single mom on welfare and food stamps and free lunch programs and mayonnaise sandwiches and sugar water. All my dreams were greatly exceeded just by applying those principles that were taught to me as a little kid. While I was serving at the United States Fire Administration, a new mayor was elected in Atlanta, came to Washington, D.C., recruited me to come back to Atlanta to serve under his leadership, made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And I went back in June of 2010, and I served him faithfully until January of 2010 when he terminated me for writing, Who Told You That You Were Naked? So God prepared me through my career. So you say, well, Kelvin, that's a lot of blessings. How, how can that prepare you for what you're going through now? Well, when you are an ethnic minority in a predominantly white male organization like a fire department and you start promoting that quick, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, there's some sufferings along the way. And those sufferings prepared me for what I'm going through today. And then God prepared me through my family. 
1981, I became a firefighter, but I also became a very popular guy all of a sudden. I was wildly popular with women all of a sudden, which was new to me because coming up in high school or uh, in school, I was always the skinniest. I was always the worst dressed because I wore my brother's, big brother's hand-me-down clothes. Uh, I couldn't grow an afro, and you had to have an afro if you were going to get a pretty girl on the pep squad, a cheerleader, or a majorette back in those days. Mine would only grow on the top and on the side. Thank God the style changed to the crew cut that I'm wearing today. I'd have never got a girlfriend if it required an afro. And so, but when I came, when I became a firefighter and started wearing that uniform, it was just something about that uniform that attracted women like a supernatural magnet. And so I dated like crazy. For about four months, I wore that uniform everywhere. I think I even wore it to the nightclubs just to have an edge on the other guys. <laughs> and then God woke me up one morning and said, this is not the life I've called you to live, and you need to find yourself a wife. And so I thought, well, you know, I, I heard the voice of God, and we didn't have ChristianMingle.com and Match.com back in those days. And so I picked up the telephone book when I thought about my plan was... Let me think about the girls that I've admired all my life, and whichever one starts my heart to singing, that's the one God wants me to marry. So I thought about the girls that I knew and liked in college, nothing happened. High school, nothing happened. Middle school, nothing happened. When I got to elementary school, there was a girl in elementary school that was my little sweetheart. Her name was Carolyn Marshall, and my heart started to sing, and I said, she must be the one. So I picked up the telephone book and went to the Marshall section, and I started at the top of the list with the A Marshall, and this was my spiel. I dialed the number and I said, my name is Kelvin Cochran. I'm trying to find the girlfriend I used to go with in the fourth grade. Her name is Carolyn Marshall. Does she live here? They said, no. I said, well, do you know anybody that knows her? And they said, no. So I went through the whole list that way. Nobody admitted they knew who she was. I was miserable. But since she grew up in the same poor neighborhood I did in shotgun houses and projects, I said, well, let me just go riding through the neighborhood. So I did that for two weeks, riding through the neighborhood, hoping that one day I'd see her sitting on the front porch drinking a cold glass of sugar water, or maybe I'd see her walking down the street, or maybe I'd run into somebody that could tell me where she was. That came up empty. I went back to my apartment. I was miserable. And then God spoke to me and said, check the phone book again. And so I looked in the phone book in the Marshall section, and out of all those Marshalls, I skipped one. I was checking them off as I go, and for somehow uh, reason, I skipped one. So I said, I might as well call this one. So I called that number, and I was not as enthusiastic this time. I said, my name is Kelvin Cochran. I'm trying to find a girlfriend I used to go with in the fourth grade. Her name is Carolyn Marshall. Do you know her? And the voice said, this is she. Man, I got all excited. I said, Carolyn, do you remember me? She says, yeah, I remember you, Kelvin Cochran. I said, yeah, this is Kelvin. I cut straight to the chase. I said, Carolyn, I'm a firefighter now. I got a good job with good benefits. I've been dating like crazy for the last four months. God woke me up one morning and said, you need to find yourself a wife, and you are the chosen one. <laughs> and she said, you must be crazy. I said, no, I'm not crazy. Can I come over and talk to you about it? She said, no, you can't come over here. I have a boyfriend, and he's on the way over here. And man, I just went for it. I said, Carolyn, you're supposed to be my wife. God told me you're going to be my wife. We're going to get married. We're going to have beautiful children. We'll have a nice home. You'll never want for anything. Now, here's a broke firefighter talking about you'll never want it. You'll never want for anything. It must have resonated with her because the next words out of her mouth was, well, he'll be at work tomorrow night. And so I said, so can I come over tomorrow night? And she says, yeah, you can come over tomorrow night. And I got to pause right there for station identification. Guys, let me tell you, if your sweetheart has another boyfriend right now, don't quit. If he doesn't have a, if he doesn't have a plan for the future, you still have a shot. <laughs> so I went over the next night, and she was still living in the projects and still living with her mama. And uh, when I went in, she made me a cup of hot chocolate. It was a cold January night. When she came back with the hot chocolate, I knelt on one knee. And I proposed to her. I didn't even have a ring. And she said, Mama, you got to come in here. You're not going to believe this. I talked to this boy on the phone last night. I let him come over tonight. I made him some chocolate. And he just proposed to marry me. And I hadn't seen him in years. 
And I had to explain to her mother that I wasn't crazy. Well, six months later, we got married. And last June, we celebrated 33 years of holy matrimony. But guys, don't try that method at home. Don't try it at home. (laughs) But here's the deal. This is how the preparation. When you skip dating and courtship and go right to engagement and marriage in a span of six months, you're going to have some sufferings along the way. But if you're rooted and grounded in Christ, those sufferings are going to build up your marriage and build up your family to where your family will be prepared when you go through something that I'm experiencing right now. And so what was the book about? You're probably saying, well, what was this book about? Three and a half years ago, I'm conducting a men's Bible study. And I asked the men, are men today still suffering from the consequences of what Adam did in the garden? And all of them said, yes, we are still suffering from the consequences. And so I asked them to explain why they felt that way. Listen, guys, every man, Christian men, all they were talking about were challenges they were having in our carnal nature. And as they were talking, the question God asked Adam in the garden, who told you that you were naked? It just kept repeating itself over and over in my head. And so like I did in early 2000s with that word suffering, I was curious enough to go back home and research the word naked because I felt that God was asking Adam more than who told you that you don't have on any clothes. And I found out that nakedness in that context meant condemned and deprived. When I found out what nakedness meant, God said, now you need to find out the opposite of naked, which is clothed. So I researched the word clothed, and it means redeemed and restored. And then God said, go back to the garden and look at Adam's solution to his nakedness. Adam's solution to his nakedness was fig leaves for him and Eve. It didn't work. He still felt condemned and deprived. They hid behind a tree and it still didn't work. God found out what was going on, had a desire to make things right. And so he took an innocent lamb, a perfect, innocent, precious lamb, hadn't done anything, and he killed it. It shed its blood. And the scripture says... He clothed them with coats of skin. He redeemed and restored them in a relationship with him. Fast forward to Calvary. The Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, was slain, perfect Lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world. Galatians 3.27 says, those who have been baptized in Christ have been clothed with Christ. And then God told me the reason why that question was so on my mind. He said to me, I've got too many clothed men, saved men who are not realizing all of my promises as husbands, fathers, sons, uncles, leaders, businessmen, because they are still clothed men are still acting like naked men, condemned and deprived men. They're double minded. They're saying they're saved, but they're act. They're saying they're clothed, but acting like they're naked, double minded. And the scripture says a double-minded man cannot receive anything from the Lord. Adam never answered the question when God asked him, who told you you were naked? And so I'm asking men today, Christian men, who told you that you were naked? What in the book caused the trouble? Well, in the book, I deal with sexual sin, which is a challenge for many Christian men. And I went back to the origin. Why did, did God create it? Yes, he did. Why did he create it? He created it for procreation. He wanted Adam and Eve to populate the earth and that for generations and generations, families would populate the earth. So procreation, if that's God's purpose for it, can only occur between a man and a woman. And to do it in a way that honors God, it has to be done in holy matrimony. Saying that in that book costs me my childhood dream come true fairy tale career. And so what am I to do? What are we to do as believers when we face persecution for our faith? We stand on the promises of God. Listen, we've been going through this process for a while. If you've known Christ for a while and you've heard sermons and Sunday school lessons and vacation Bible schools, wonderful worship songs, God is preparing us for that eventual day for us to have the courage enough to stand by faith and have greater faith in the world, in the kingdom consequences than fear in the worldly consequences. 
there are scriptures that I learned over the years that have blessed me tremendously through this trial that I'm going through. Men, you got to take note of these. One set of scriptures is in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14. I know it just like I know the preamble and the Pledge of Allegiance. There are another one is Psalm 112. When men read Psalm 112 in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, you see the vision that God has for us as men. Then the other one was Psalm 27. I don't know why God put that one on my heart, or I didn't know why he put that one on my heart to remember years ago until the day after my suspension, when I was on the treadmill, which is when I recite those scriptures, when I'm on the treadmill, I just say them all. By the time I finish, I've done a good 30, 45 minute workout. But when I begin to recite Psalm 27 that next day, I know why God put that in my spirit. Because here's what it says, and I'm finished. I want you to think about it when you come into your circumstances. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. And whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Oh, and hosted in camp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, and now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. He shall set me up upon a rock. Therefore, I will offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord shall take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. Deliver me not over until the will of my enemies for false witnesses have risen up against me and such as breathe out cruelty. David shifts from praying to encouraging himself. He says, I would have fainted lest I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He ends encouraging himself by saying, wait on the Lord. And be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Faculty, staff, students, it's not a matter of if you will face a day of a fiery trial or a test to whether or not you really have the courage to confess your faith in biblical truth and in Jesus Christ. It's just a matter of when. And I hope that I have shared something with you today that will strengthen you for that eventual moment. Remember this when your time comes and you begin to experience persecution for standing. Our back is not against the wall. We are not at the end of our rope. And throwing in the towel is not an option for a child of God. My personal resolve is I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Would you pray with me? Dear God, our Heavenly Father, how I lift up your name today before these precious students here at Shorter University who have their whole life ahead of them here in our beloved nation. And, oh God, how I pray that you would instill in them boldness and courage and tenacity that they will rejoice in excitement over faith in the kingdom consequences 
And that when their day of trial and test comes, that they will not have fear of the worldly consequences. I pray your blessings on the faculty and staff that are here that they will also have the same assurance and the same blessing on their life because they too will face uh, their eventual day of test and trial as to whether they will stand or not, whether they will have fear or faith. And I pray, dear God, that you would give them greater faith and less fear. Now, Father, the words that you have given me to say, I have shared them with you, with them, with all of my heart. It's your truth. It is your word. And let it go forth and not return void. Bless them now as they wind down this semester. And may they be fully focused and engaged and do the very best they can on their finals. And we will give you all the praise for what you're doing in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.